Okay. Good evening, everyone. Today we are meeting at the seventh episode of Archi Design Talks at Bahçeşehir University Faculty of Architecture and Design. Our uh, guest for today is Gül Kaçmaz Erk from Belfast University. And the title of the presentation will be about bridging architecture and cinema. And um, our moderator today will be Işıl Hoca, Işıl Baysan Serim. So I'm keeping my word short and leave the stage to you, Işıl Hoca. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, good evening to all the guests. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be a moderator for this talk. Um, again, welcome to all of you joining us. Uh, as Hocam uh, said, my name is Işıl Baysan Serim, and I am also from Bahçeşehir University, Department of Architecture as well. Uh, I'm a part-time lecturer. And so uh, um, on behalf of the Department of Architecture, uh, I would like to uh, extend a very warm uh, welcome to Gül. Uh, we appreciate uh, your taking time of your busy uh, schedule to join us uh, today. Um, it will be great uh, luck uh, to talk to you about your experience on cinematic architecture. And thanks to Bahçeşehir University and the Dean of the Faculty and Murat Dündar and to the head of the uh, architecture de department, Professor Dr. Nihal. Vinilay Insal for having us, me and Bill. And um, we are pleased to welcome all of you, the audience, um, to talk on bridging cinema and architecture. In this occasion, uh, we would like to have a seminar uh, from Gül Kaçmaz Erk. Um, first of all, uh, let me introduce uh, our honorable guest, Gül Kaçmaz Erk. Uh, actually, I know it has already been introduced, um, so I just want to do a really quick introduction. Uh, as you know, she is from Belfast Queen's University. Uh, uh, basically, Queen's University School of Natural, a uh, good School of Natural and Environmental Design. I think. Nat natural and build environment. Excuse me, build environment. Yes, yes, excuse me. And um, the purpose of having this talk uh, is to explore uh, as uh, the topic we give, uh, the cinematic architecture, breaching cinema and architecture. Above all, uh, as you know, both an architecture and cinema uh, use visual and functional qualities to create uh, spaces that did not exist before. Through these paths and similarities, uh, it can be argued that the cinema image uh, can alter and enrich the vision of a designer. And in the contemporary times, images uh, that are presented in cinema are uh, the most important uh, source uh, of information and virtual experience as the information offered uh, by the films seems to be um, embedded into the script and is the cinematographic technologies and uh, of the relationship, uh, excuse me, based on the imaginary events. And um, that's why it's so crucial uh, to explore uh, the promises of the relationship uh, between cinema and architecture. And yes, it will be great uh, that we can all meet today um, in this event. In conclusion, uh, we will try to leave a uh, time item for a question and answer Q&A uh, session. Uh, of course, time permits, uh, because when we get uh, together with Gül, <laughs> there is so much to talk about uh, that we cannot understand how time passes. Uh, anyway, uh, the audience uh, can submit questions by typing maybe in chat box. Uh, is, it, is it so? Uh, I think they can write on chat box. And um, now, 
we are ready to begin to talk. Without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, leave the word to Gül. First of all, Gül, uh, you were uh, like me. You were trained at the Middle East uh, Technical University as an architect. And then you decided uh, to do your master thesis, dissertation on cinema and architecture. And uh, indeed, you are considered a pioneer uh, in this regard in Turkey. Uh, and you start walking and moving uh, on this road. Uh, why cinema and architecture and how this journey begin? Uh, can you draw uh, us an itinerary? I can try. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the kind words, um, everybody, uh, whether I deserve them or not is another issue, but thank you so much for your kind words. I guess um, my, um, I was from a family a science high school, so coming into architecture and uh, being introduced to design at, uh, at Matthew in early 1990s, uh, was a big change for me, but I did fall in love with architecture and whatever I do, I still consider myself as an architect and I look at the world and cinema and um, humanitarian architecture through my um, architectural lens, I think. Um, I did ask that question to myself as well, how it all began. I think I always loved cinema, obviously. You need to love something if you spent 20-something um, years on it. Um, but I think, um, and somebody maybe can g tell me who that was, one of our tutors in undergrad in uh, Lisan's times, around the time, 1993, I think, uh, somewhere in a small classroom close to Kubelt showed us two Jack Dutty films, um, My Uncle and uh, Playtime. Great. It blew my mind. Looking at a fiction film, which is so critical of modern architecture, that is shown in one of the most important modern buildings um, uh, in, in the campus, the School of Architecture uh, on the Otto uh, campus, um, it blew my mind. Obviously, um, we were being trained as modernists. Our tutors were modernists. They were um, uh, lectured through Louis Kahn at Penn. They came and passed on the passion to us. And then seeing this critical film was unbelievable. Um, when I finished my undergrad, I decided to work on cinema and architecture, and there, that wasn't a thing at the time, at least um, at Matthew. Uh, and um, Abdi Gizar Hoca kindly agreed to supervise me. And um, um, because there was so little, because even, you know, worldwide, this, this area of research began um, in 1990s. So uh, it's the same time I'm doing this. There's so few sources. There were two um, special issues of A&D, Architectural Design uh, Magazine, uh, which were really good. Cinema Plus Film, that was the title, number one, and years later, number two. One in 90s, one, I think, in 2000. And uh, I can um, pull them out from, from my library if needed, if people want to see it. Um, so basically, I looked at um, at that point in Masters um, at Matthew on um, Peter Greenaway's British films and uh, Wim Wenders' uh, German films. So European cinema, basically, to understand the relationship between architecture and cinema. Um, th then I made a little book, this tiny little book, um, out of that master's thesis. I don't know if you can see the title. Can you? It's called Architecture in Cinema, um, a relation of representation based on space. Uh, usually, um, uh, Turkish people who work on cinema and architecture know me from, from this little book. Um, then I wanted to move on because here I tried to see what are the links, what overlaps, what doesn't overlap. So I looked at really very basic concepts between the two disciplines. And then in PhD, I wanted to do a change of scenery. I really like Istanbul. I'm originally from Izmir. <laughs> we have another guest from 
Chikurawa. Hello, how are you? Um, so at that point, I I started with Balka Sulolo um, in, in E2 and then wrote this thesis, which is called Architectural Space in the Digital Age. OK, maybe I show the official one, you know, we submit like this. Architectural space in the digital age, cyberspace, hyperspace, exospace through science fiction films. So in the masters, I, in my own way, understood what's going on between the two. Uh, and then in, in the next step in the PhD, I wanted to use cinema, basically science fiction cinema as a tool to understand the relationship between architecture and the digital spaces which were emerging. So we are still in 90s, end of 90s and 2000s. I, I finished this in 2004. So I was looking at exospace. That's the word I coined, I made up. Exospace means all the digitally supported spaces that we build as humans outside of Earth like a satellite, international space station, something, a lunar, you know, uh, base would be an exospace. And then cyberspace, you know, the space in the computer, uh, the two-dimensional um, computer space. And hyperspace, I define it as the virtual real space uh, where um, you use, um, you know, goggles like this and then uh, go into a virtual a real system or um, you through your phone or something else, you have augmented reality where the, the real architecture and the hologram or the image uh, are merged. So I looked at all these in early 2000s and it was quite early. Uh, we are just talking about those concepts in more detail and in reality, applying them to architecture nowadays. So virtual reality was a big um, issue then and then it became less fashionable and then now it's a big big issue with metaverse and everything as well that's another big big topic so I won't go into this um, from that on I did many different things at the intersection of cinema and architecture I also started working on humanitarian architecture um, and link that actually just like you Ishil, uh, probably in Turkey we are the two people who link cinematic architecture and humanitarian architecture together I may be wrong um, so many things have happened so my journey goes like that in terms of why cinema uh, and all these were happening because uh, my PhD was so um, high-tech let's say at, at the time uh, I finished everything in Metu and everything in Bilkent libraries and it wasn't even enough. So I went to um, University of Pennsylvania for the research of my PhD. So in my late 20s, I moved to uh, Philly, Philadelphia, and then did my research there and then came back. Then I, after that, I moved to Amsterdam. That's where I finished my PhD, started working. I was working um, full time um, actually as an architect in Istanbul while I was doing my PhD part time. Uh, it took me uh, quite some time to finish the PhD for that reason. Uh, so I continued working as an architect, freelance architect in, um, in Holland and then finished my PhD. After Holland, I moved back to Turkey, to Izmir, to my hometown, to we were building a new school of architecture in um, Izmir uh, University of Economics, which was great fun. Uh, the team was amazing. Um, I spent a couple of years there. After that, I moved to Dublin with my family and then I got the job here in Queens. So uh, Queens is not in uh, in Dublin, it's in Belfast, but they're quite close by train, uh, a bit more than two hours. So I started commuting um, for the first five years, then the whole family moved to Belfast. And in the last five years, we have been in Belfast. I'm saying these things because uh, sometimes people are curious about how you end up in, in a country or in a city. I did move around um, a lot. It all started with the research of my PhD and, you know, one thing followed uh, another thing and then here I am. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Thank you very much again. And um, while uh, I remember while you are making your dissertation, PhD degree, uh, 
you uh, work on a great film, Thomas in Love. It's a great film. Uh, and you choose a model uh, or example for your PhD degree, I think. When you say model, what do you mean? Uh, you uh, for for the spaces for the exospace uh, to to show to reveal how exospace uh, works, and you uh, choose this film, and uh, it's an amazing film, and nobody knows in Turkey this film. How did you reach this film? How did you find it? That's that's interesting to ask. Uh, yes, nobody knows about Thomas in Love. It's a small yeah. Bel Belgian film. Yes, yeah, very small film, very nice film. I like it so much. And uh, I I watched it right away uh, when it was filmed uh, in Istanbul Film Festival. I'm sure it's still the same. At the time, uh, that festival was a lifesaver. There were so many good films yeah. coming to your doorstep to to talk to them all the time. So in the um, in the PhD, that these are some images from Thomas in Love. Uh, Pierre Paul Randers is the film director. And um, what's interesting, uh, this one is actually for the cyberspace. For Exospace, I had 2001, uh, A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick. This one yeah. for the cyberspace. I, it's I, like we are in the cyberspace right now all together. And then for uh, the virtual reality version, hyperspace, uh, I had um, The Matrix, the very first Matrix, which was made in uh, um, 1990. Yes, you, you yeah. made and you made a presentation in Design Cinema. I remember about Matrix. I'm sure I did. I make so many presentations. <laughs> okay. okay, I reached okay. out to the director of this film, Thomas in Love, he, lo lovely um, filmmaker, mm -hmm. and uh, I added his input into it. Thomas in Love was interesting because it, it was even before Skype. You know, nothing visual like this. Um, was in was in our lives, and Toma has agoraphobia and sociophobia, so he can't leave his home. He's always at home, and it's like a near future film. He's using something called Visiophone, <laughs> which is actually now Teams, uh, yeah. to communicate with other people. Uh, and everything we were seeing in the film what was what he was seeing on the screen. We never ever saw Thomas. We only heard him talk to people, and then uh, we only saw the people he was talking to. So at the time, that was really interesting before it became part of our lives. Science fiction is so interesting. Something done in science fiction becomes reality. If humans can imagine something, they find a way to make it real, just like virtual reality. The, the Matrix or the holodeck in Star Trek, they're coming. <laughs> yes, that's, you're right. You're exactly right. And uh, then uh, you're and, uh, your friend uh, recently completed another book after this little book uh, with very strong roots. You have uh, reproduced uh, the relationship between cinema, architecture, and memory through Berlin, uh, Berlin, and which is perhaps the city where uh, cinematic memory is most uh, institutionalized. I, I could say. How did you decide to work uh, with the other author, and why Berlin? I'm very curious about it, and what was the critical argument when uh, creating the outline of the book? Let, let, let me share my screen. Let me see. Includes computer sound. Hopefully the sound will work as well. Let me know if you see my screen. Yes. OK, good. Uh, you see Christopher here? Is that the screen you see with Anat Kabir? Yes, yes, we see. Okay, thank you. So uh, Christopher and I worked in um, in Izmir Economy University um, when I was a lecturer there. Um, he was first in Bilkent. He was teaching in Bilkent in Ankara, and he did his PhD in Metu, uh, 
when I didn't know him by then. Uh, and his um, PhD was on Anutkabir and uh, architecture and memory. Let me see. This is, um, he was writing obviously in English. So it was called Beyond Anutkabir, the funerary architecture of Ataturk. Uh, he's a big Ataturk fan as well, you can imagine. Uh, so he wrote this and looked at um, not just the Anad Kabir as we know it, but the, all the competition projects beforehand and linked all that to the early history of um, the Republic of Turkey, as well as the, the national uh, collective memory uh, of Turkey. He then published it as a book. This is the book cover. And then after that, I think it was translated into Turkish, which is also available, which is this one. Anutkabirin um, Ötesi Atatürk'ün Mezar Mimarisi. So then everybody moved on. Christopher uh, moved to uh, Florida. I think he's in sunny Florida here in this picture. And then I moved to uh, Ireland. Uh, one day, I think about 10, 10 years ago, he sent me an email and said we had done some, uh, you know, papers together in the past. Uh, he said um, very, very short email saying you cinema and architecture, me memory and architecture. Let's attend this conference. So the, in the attachment, there is a call for a conference in Australia, um, which was on these topics. And we send an abstract um, about memory, architecture, and cinema. And uh, we said, OK, which case study should we do? I proposed a few things. I was in Belfast, so I said it could be Belfast. It could be Berlin, because you know Berlin is famous with all this. Beirut, maybe. Uh, Istanbul obviously came up. Um, and then Christopher decided, proposed to do Berlin because he had um, worked in Berlin uh, briefly in, um, after the wall came down. So the abstract was on Berlin. OK, neither of us went to Australia to that conference. Uh, it was too far. It was in December. You know, December is very busy and the first semester here and in America, so we couldn't go. But we continued the work and we did publish um, this topic at some point. Actually, let me find that one. Um, reframing Berlin. What did we call that one? Let me say Wilson, Kachmas. It will probably come up. This one, Frame the Memories of Berlin. Ah, okay, that's my thing. Let's go back. Let's find it. Yeah, that one. Let's find it from the publisher. So we've published this. Um, we went there in 2013, one year later, um, to, to decide. We And then we published this after a few years uh, in uh, Architecture and Culture Journal. Uh, but when we were doing this, we realized that we were actually comparing different periods of Berlin's history uh, in the 20th century with what is happening there at the moment. So this is Alexander Platz uh, in um, early years of cinema. Uh, so beginning of 20th century, this is Alexander Platz today at the time. Oh, apparently the whole the whole article is here. Um, the Potsdamer Platz 1920s through the famous uh, Berlin Symphony of a Great City, um, a contemporary image. So the, these are photos by us and these are film stills. And it went on like that. Um, the Nazi uh, stadium, Olympic Stadium, um, and then the contemporary version. So as we uh, did this through fragmented Berlin, you know, what did we call the first one? Let's see. Um, capital city Berlin, divided Berlin, etc. As we were doing this, and we're literally uh, in Berlin doing the research, we thought, OK, there is so much material on architecture, cinema, and memory here that um, th this, this is a book outline. This is not just an article. We did do the article. The article is more film-based, so cinema is quite dominant here. Um, but we thought the book can be more on memory um, because what we discovered there is that 
a lot has been changing in the history of um, Berlin and Germany in 20th century, basically when cinema started in 19, uh, sorry, 1895, all the way to today. Uh, throughout the history of cinema, Berlin evolved and changed so much that uh, we need to map this. So that was the that was the approach. That's how the book idea came about. And it took us obviously uh, several years. Um, we both work quite hard, um, intensely. We teach a lot, so it wasn't possible. But we did come up with with some models um, for this book, which is now um, being published um, in less than a year, next year, this is coming out. This one is called Reframing Berlin Architecture, Urban Strategies, Memory Making and Film Locations. So basically, there's a lot of books on um, Berlin and memory, understandably, um, but um, there is none which looks at the whole um, century uh, through an architectural perspective. Although we talk about urbanism here, uh, both of us are architects and that's our focal point. Uh, and also nobody tried to bring all, all the urban changes that's happening in the city in one in one study. So this is what uh, we have done. We said they're doing so many things, mostly authorities, developers, even sometimes uh, grassroots, uh, you know, people, uh, Berliners doing all this stuff in the city whenever it's needed and this is affecting the urban memory of Berlin. So that was our starting point. We call these urban strategies uh, and these this list is not inclusive. It, uh, you can add to this, you can take out from this. So uh, for instance, demolition, getting rid of a building which we are very, um, we, we know this well from Turkey, a building is there one day and then you visit that city the next year, the building is gone, it's demolished and you uh, maybe uglier building is there. So demolition, what does that do on the memory spectrum that we defined? Did, this is uh, goes in the forgetting um, direction. So when when you gözden uh, rak gönülden de rak. When you don't see a building, uh, you know, it's hard to remember it from the past and the new generations won't remember it. Or you make a temporary installation some, somewhere. Yes, it's there. It has a presence effect, but it's temporary. So when it's gone, you know, it's forgotten. New construction, you know, again, more on the forgetting side about the past. We had other ones like touristification. You take an existing building and touristify it. Disnification, you do it in the most um, awful way. Uh, I can go into the details. Mutation is when a, a building, a place, a structure, a, um, a square changes multiple times. Many things happens to it. Uh, under this one, we have the Berlin Wall, which had um, many stages. Uh, and also, I think we put there Potsdamer plots, which changed a lot over the years. Supplementation is when you add something um, new to the building. Suspension is, um, let's say uh, the building is in ruined state, and then you uh, leave it in that state, but keep it, not demolish it. Relocation takes a building or structure elsewhere. Believe it or not, that happens more often than you expect. Adaptation, we usually call this adaptive reuse, now very popular in um, sustainable architecture. How you take an existing building which is not used and adapted for a new use. Appropriation when the not the um, design, but the meaning of a building changes. Replication, you know, make the fake version of it, preservation, uh, conservation, uh, protecting it, and memorialization is when you, when there is an event that is important to that city and you create a memorial to keep that memory intact for the citizens. So um, uh, this is all a spectrum. You go from this side to this side and you can add to this. We had other ones that we, didn't think um, was needed for Berlin, like uh, beautification, subtraction, a few more. Uh, but this was our model for Berlin. Sorry, this was a long, long answer. <laughs>
<laughs> Yo, this is amazing again. Thank you very much. Good. And um, I think, in fact, uh, isn't the bar, a way you work in a sense a montage event, event uh, that shape uh, the relationship of avant-garde architecture in the 1920s with cinema and uh, a technique that both reproduces memory and, as Freud said, unwell the repressed. Because um, you analyze the film locations in Berlin through some uh, these concepts uh, you found. And uh, here we can say the truth of the matter um, that uh, film images are manufactured images and including the spaces used and aim uh, for an approach uh, that reflects their creators' ideas and through uh, the predefined performance of the characters or um, the situation of the objects, uh, for example, architecture objects into a whole space which serves the script needs and uh, is placed in a certain period uh, past, historical, present, contemporary, future, idealistic, as you investigated in this book. And um, you use uh, this accumulated knowledge for the educational purpose as well. You have a, a cine art studio in Belfast, and uh, you invited me some juries. Uh, I attended them. And uh, as I followed, uh, you focus on the contribution of cinema to revealing and understanding design ideas and stimulating student cooperation in architectural design education procedure. The topic uh, or subjects are based on the use of some future films as a methodological tool in architectural design education leading to the um, comprehension of the meaning in space production and architectural design. But of course, there is a requirement diagram or requirement uh, toolbox that you created. How have you formed this process or the process of Sina Art Studio? Uh, you brought this up, but you did uh, mention other stuff uh, linked to memory and architecture and film. Uh, so I'll st uh, start with uh, with that first and then move on to the studio, if that's OK. So okay. Ju just, to, just to answer what you're saying about, yes, cinema creates memory and affects memory. And um, yeah. almost, uh, w what's the term, um, alters memory. Uh, fools, almost fools memory, huh? Something created in cinema, we, we believe in it as if it's the real thing. Uh, so one in one of the, we have these um, collages as we call them in the book. So this one is about um, Disneyfication and Checkpoint Charlie, uh, the famous, you know, um, transition between the Soviet sector to, uh, to the American sector. And these images, the five of them here, are real, uh, this is the real Checkpoint Charlie uh, where films are made at the time um, from 66 to 68. It, so the wall is built in 61, 1961 uh, and has been there uh, until 1989. Um, so these are the real ones and uh, used in the films. Uh, here they are actually moving the, the guardhouse, the American guardhouse. It's on, I don't know if you can see it, it's actually lifted uh, with ropes and, and, and it's going elsewhere. And after that, as you can see here, um, it's not there. There's a fake one there. Anyways, and then in, in these images, because there's no Checkpoint Charlie left, obviously, why would you need it after the wall is down? Uh, all these are what we call simulated Checkpoint Charlies. They're not the real one. Uh, actually, you can see here, this was the guardhouse, and in this one is uh, pretty, pretty accurate, actually, uh, in a, <coughs> excuse me, spy movie in, uh, from the 60s, whereas, um, say, in these two, and this one is quite accurate as well from um, uh, a contemporary film, these two are um, so different than what Checkpoint Char Charlie was like. But, 
the feeling here uh, created with this impossibility of passage from one side to the other or the possibility of being shot if you try to uh, that are uh, demonstrated in both films from 2007 and uh, 2013 um that is represent, uh, represented with the architecture created so this is inaccurate in terms of film location it's simulated but then it's trying to capture the memory the people had while they were close to one of the checkpoints so i agree with you when you say um film has an influence on, of us when it comes to memory and th that's quite a tempting issue but we try to focus in the book to the concept of memory, although we used cinema intensely, um, we approached it from architecture. We were looking at how changes in architecture all with these urban strategies were affecting the urban memory of the city. We were using um, film locations and film stills and film scenes, as you see here, um, as an archive as a dispositive, as an apparatus, as we were discussing uh, a study we did together, um, actually about the refugee children's uh, YouTube videos. Um, so film as an archive from the past, because these are all real images. Uh, you can even see them as photographs from the past. They show the actual Checkpoint Charlie. Um, so we were using film as a as a digital archive, as a visual archive, audiovisual archive, and then looking at the uh, changes in the urban memory of the city uh, based on the changes in architecture. Um, so that was a difficult one to explain actually in in the book, but we did uh, manage to keep it that way because we really wanted to say. We are architects, we understand architecture. Yes, we are using film in the best way we can, but we are actually interested in how architecture affects memory. And that's the book is about. Does it make sense at all? Did I manage to explain this? Yes, of course, of course, every time. You're welcome. Okay. Every time. And to say, if you, if you uh, didn't forget, uh, am I... Uh, repeat do i repeat the question or uh you go i remember i'm coming to the studio okay. now uh, before okay. they they kick us out because uh i i realize we are talking a lot so cine arch is uh, a baby now uh which is three years old so it started as a vertical studio in queens and a vertical studio means um, not, let's say, all fourth years take it, but different years take that studio. So in our case, undergraduate uh, is two, three years and um, master's is two years. So that's the system here, three plus two. And then in undergrad, we started Cine Arch three years ago. Um, be, and second, second and third year students were taking the studio. And then we did it twice with undergrads. And then uh, I started to um, to coordinate um, a new master's. Let me find that as well somewhere. So this new this new master's called uh, Advanced Architectural Design. We started this literally this year uh, th that you came to the reviews of. Um, and uh, we moved the Cine Art Studio to this master's and we are using the know-how, the things we uh, improved in the undergraduate um, studio, we are uh, actually using here. So this is one of the briefs. <laughs> Students get really scared when you get a brief like this because this brief only uh, covers the first five weeks, so one month of the studio and it's 12 pages. But it has to be like that because uh, we give this to architects and we want them to do cinematic stuff that you have never done before. Um, so it needs to be quite detailed. So I run this with Pat Wheeler, who is a well-known um, practicing architect uh, in Belfast. So he's a designer. Uh, and then we have Richard Kirk, who is a big name uh, from University of Liverpool, uh, who works on cinema and architecture. He has many books. Um, let me see if I can very quickly see something here. 
for instance, this one, the city and the moving image urban projections. I know I'm small there, but this is his book, if people have seen it. Um, he has many books. Um, so Richard is helping out and our um, external examiner is Francois Pans. Pans is what I call the first generation of uh, architects who work on cinema and architecture. Urban uh, Cinematics is one of his books. Um, and uh, people like myself, Richard, Ushul, uh, we are the second generation um, who work on cinema and architecture. Uh, so these people are involved. Uh, I knew them from, from before, so, so they kindly agreed to join us. Um, and then the project doesn't matter. The project is, a, is an architectural project and it can be anything. Um, in this case, it was kind of interesting. It's a weddings and funerals building uh, where ceremonies, uh, non-religious uh, weddings and non-religious uh, funerals would take place. Um, and then um, what we do uh, is we start the studio by choosing a film scene. I put a lot of film stills into uh, this first brief, like these ones. Um, and then students choose one of those. Then they go and find, say, let's say this is Roma and Juliet. They go and find this film, watch it, watch that scene and they analyze that scene. So I give them the films, they choose one of them uh, with this format. I think this is what you were asking. I did this uh, in, in, in the undergrad with less structure and uh, I wasn't getting the, the, the results that I wanted. So I improved this in, in the three years and this uh, works really well at the moment. So first of all, they draw the cinematic plan and cinematic section of that film scene. They make what I call a mood paint. They make a painting to capture, literal painting, like acrylic painting or watercolor painting to capture the mood, the feeling in the scene. They uh, divide that film steel into its layers, like foreground, middle ground, background. They actually recreate it on their screen and do a rendering of the. Um, so they create, uh, they try to mimic that image uh, with uh, CAD using CAD uh, and rendering techniques. They make a poster for that scene. They abstract it. And, and then and this is an important one. They make a storyboard for that scene and they make a collage. Um, for collage, uh, one of my PhDs, let me see if I can find Kleena's work. She does amazing collages in her, um, in her own uh, thesis. She just finished actually. It's going to be hopefully published. Let me see. No, not that one. Oh, there's so much here that I opened. Let me find that. Maybe I'll show it through this. So this is one of the students who did this analysis. This is his portfolio. So this is the scene from Lan Lola Run, a Berlin film. She's running through this bridge, so it's exterior. And then this is, well, he didn't do a, a plan, but he did an axonometric, cinematic axonometric. So what does cinematic plan or section mean? This is the section. Um, you draw it architecturally, but you also draw the characters and their movements. You also uh, draw the, the camera and then how the camera, um, you know, what the camera shows. So this is cinematic plan and, uh, sorry, axonometric and section. This is spatial layering. You look at what is in the foreground, middle ground, um, background. This is his storyboard. So he chose uh, these uh, moments in the scene. And um, this is actually lovely. Uh, he drew uh, these himself. This is his poster. This is a painting he did, uh, which is actually darker than everything else, but she is really frustrated running uh, to find money for the boyfriend. If you have, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a lovely film. Lan Lola Run um, from 1998, I think. 
this is the feeling. And then he made a collage like this one um, for the for the scene. Now, the the next thing they do, which is uh, the important part, where did my there? So after they do all this, they reverse this procedure and um, I only give them very little about the project at the beginning. So they know that it's a weddings and funerals building. They don't know all the details. They know the site though. They make a site film and everything. And then they uh, do an architectural collage without even drawing a plan or section. They make a storyboard. This is the most important one, I guess. Uh, they make a storyboard for um, for their for their building. Let me see. This was uh, the student. So he chose some key spaces he wanted to include in the in the building and then drew uh, some tiny um, hand drawn perspective sketches of that. This was the, the feeling he wanted to capture. You know, he made a concept film, as I call it, which is not on the list, but that's one of the things we do. So we take these cinematic um, analysis techniques that um, we developed and then we reverse them and we use them to understand what we want to design as an architect. So this is like um, a reversed version of architectural design because when we design, we usually look at the big picture. We approach, you know, we look at the city, which we normally also do in the studio, conventional techniques together with some unconventional cinematic techniques. For instance, to do the light analysis, these are actually film stills from um, the light analysis. Film is a good medium to understand how light works on a site. Um, so when we design, we do it from, this is their site film, we do it from top to bottom, don't we? Uh, we look at it, say we make a model, we look at it as if we are, uh, you know, look at it from bird's eye view, we look at the whole thing, and then we start to, you know, improve what, what's going to go inside. In this approach, it's bottom up. So you look at bits and pieces of the building, you want uh, you decide what different rooms or different promenades different uh, experiences walks like here this guy walking in this space where the heights change this was his section based on his experience with cinematic section uh, some more circulation storyboards here and his plan started to develop based on what he learned in his um in his cinematic analysis otherwise we wouldn't have a building like this so these spaces are all designed as to uh what he wanted people to experience because in because with cinema we always talk about experience what people uh will feel what people will see um, I didn't ask this, but the students did it anyway. So they, when they finished, they took their plans and they showed how for a funeral and how for a wedding people uh, and the bride and the groom would circulate and use the building, different levels of the building. So she, they made a cinematic plan of the building. <coughs> so very experiential um, buildings come up at the end. Some more images from this is his portfolio simply animated. We also do, um, as you have seen here, we also do physical models. These are actually photos uh, or, or film, film steals of uh, a physical model, which I find always useful. So uh, on, on the one hand here, he's looking at um, Sorry, let's go back. Um, the technology, not in the best way, but he improved later. But th this is lovely. He's also looking at how creating such a detail uh, creates um, this kind of light in the space and then how it will um, affect the users. And then at the end, this student went back and made another uh, storyboard of uh, uh, different moments in there. A, a bit like, um, you know, um, I'll, I'll show it here. 
if you know Serial Vision, Gordon Collins uh, book, uh, Townscape, he, he walks in the city and then he stops and draws, um, you know, a perspective of one moment. So I did introduce things like that to them. Uh, Lena introduced them. Oops, my daughter is calling me. Okay, I have to. <laughs> she didn't know I was in a talk. So, um, so we looked at things like uh, some creative collages or um, serial vision uh, or other storyboards like this one uh, from the Matrix. So this is the method we use, uh, but it always comes with a uh, film uh, like this one. Uh, even the portfolio can become a film. I'll close these ones because we have discussed um, I want to show maybe I did talk a lot, so maybe show show some films at this point. Let me see what I have here. The same student I think made this one at some point. Maybe I don't show that. F I so the first film he made was uh, this one. Uh, which is this concept film. With a concept film, they try to figure, you know how uh, you make a concept sketch. You have the project, you try to capture your first ideas, you know, Frank Gehry is famous about it. You make a sketch and then you try to, you know, uh, create that mood in the sketch in the real building. We do that with film, with concept films, like, like this one. Hope you hear the sound. So here the smoke represents people. Uh, and uh, through different um, architectural passages, thresholds, transitions, he's trying to figure out how he can move big uh, crowds uh, in a weddings and funerals building from one place to the other. this one yeah um and then later in mid-semester roughly he, he did this one just look at that issue of people using the building you know from my level just qu quick quick films like this so physical model a very rough a very rough version study model and he's looking at all these movements and passages using just a phone. This was a little workshop they did with my PhD student, um, Ejes Labora. She's our teaching assistant. Um, so they also do, sorry, they also do uh, an animation at the end of, of the semester of the whole building. Uh, another thing we did was um, to use uh, the, uh, the headset. Um, 
work with engineers, let me go to maybe we have an Instagram page if anybody is interested. So this is, for instance, what Kleena showed them uh, her storyboards, my PhD student, and then they were inspired and then they did themselves uh, things like that. This is Game of Thrones by a, a different student. This one you have seen, you know, the rendering of the space, some of the site analysis. Um, this is our studio. We don't print anymore. For instance, this is, oops, sorry. Let's go this way. So this is a mood paint, a physical painting that the student did, and then she digitized it. And it's on our mirror board, which we use a lot. Uh, for studio and then we don't print anymore we have the big tv and it, everybody sits around the table uh, or we go to a classroom usually we're here um we had masks obviously this is Eje who helped them with the uh workshop and then this is us so these are engineers software engineering students who took our 3d uh, models from sketchup of our students and they turned them into um, and uh, a VR um, app and a, and a, what is it, a AR um, app. So you can look at, uh, at it um, with the, let me find it. We did an exhibition, let's see, towards the end. Let's look at this one. We did an exhibition like physical one. And then people were also experiencing these buildings using um, using the VR. NARs, here is the QR code, you know, you scan, uh, you have the app on your phone and you can, the, the, the model of the building appears on, on the table. So it's augmented reality. So th there were many different aspects of, of the studio and students really, really enjoyed it. Um, we have been doing this for three years, but um, we have improved it, I guess, much more um, now compared to before with the master's students. There's many more I can show, but uh, I, I think it's enough. The student you have just seen, um, Ushil, this is his second semester work. So first semester was so structured. They were told what to do. And in second semester, I left them free. And then they did, they even invented their own cinematic analysis techniques like this one. They chose their own films. Uh, they did their own analysis. In this one, the, the actor is dancing. Uh, you know, on different surfaces going on. And he's showing how the actor moves, how the space is turned physically, you know, old fashioned way. And um, he was working, he was designing a building for people with who are on the autistic spectrum. So people with special needs. Uh, he was adapting an, an existing building for that because sustainability obviously is, is a big uh, issue in all architecture schools. So uh, these are some of the things he was uh, researching for the need, for, for the way how autistic people would see the world and some analysis about that. And then I didn't show any side films uh, just yet. If we have time, I can show at some point, but some of his analysis, his physical models, um, and then comes um, all the stuff he designed. So this is the existing building and this was part of the site was empty. So this is his new stuff, testing ideas with, uh, with physical models, um, conventional drawings, technical um, models, technical drawings, um, again, technical models. And yeah, this is his building there. He made a lovely building. Uh, they also do what we call public collab. Uh, all of our master's students and first year students work together uh, and they make uh, a film with broadcasting students. So film students together, um, this was uh, completely on sustainability. They were envisioning a better future for Belfast 2050. Uh, and uh, their suggestions, architectural suggestions were um, uh, in a positive way, were shared uh, in a film um, with the, you know, uh, the city council and everyone, the, the authorities were there and they, they, hopefully they will use some of the ideas produced. It's like 200 students doing this all together in, in 10 teams 
in one week, intense workshop, uh, live project, real project. Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the all, all, all very exciting and stimulating work skill. Uh, well done. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, with us all of them. And these results uh, indeed uh, are truly inspiring for us. Um, yes, it seems the architectural uh, picture has a narrative power and so do cinema images. Uh, educational methods in design and conveniently uh, mirror theoretical aspects in this uh, designing procedure through the mediation of cinema, as you uh, did very well. Uh, does it is um, suggested that within the educational procedure of obtaining knowledge through interdisciplinary approach or multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary now films could be used as a discovering process to architectural design education, as you did very well again. And uh, you also run, uh, I think you tell us uh, talk something about your MS Advanced Architectural Design Studio, um, and you define the process uh, here. But of course, in the meantime, uh, it will be good uh, to talk uh, about how to parse participate uh, in this program for the students who listen to us now. For example, uh, what prerequisites uh, do they need to complete in order to study in Belfast uh, as well as work with you? Uh, I, I would I would be delighted to have some Turkish students because uh, at the moment I have students from Ireland, obviously, but also Czech Republic, um, China, India, South Korea, but I don't have any Turkish students, so I would, I would love to. Um, my P, one of my PhDs is from from Turkey. Um, the let's go back to this one. Uh, so if they go to if they just Google advanced architectural design and write down QUB, you know Queen's University Belfast, they they will see this. Uh, all they need to do is to fill in an application form uh, and uh, submit their portfolio, their transcripts with that. And then we do the evaluation. We only take people to this master's who, who already have an undergraduate degree in architecture. So say if somebody has studied civil engineering, we don't accept them. Uh, somebody studied planning, we don't accept them. You need to have a uh, license diploma from uh, architecture uh, and then you apply. Anybody can apply. So it starts in September and finishes finishes in September. All the requirements are, are here. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I think, I think it is clear, I think, for everybody. Um, and uh, one of the events you completed recently um, this year was uh, the Wall Street uh, film series. Uh, I think uh, you actually you talked a little bit. Um, I think probably you probably opened an exhibition in parallel. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was with Wall Street. Yeah, uh, this one. I don't so, know. Uh, how how you fit all these into a semester, Gül? I don't know, but the preparation process of this exhibition is really interesting. You you tell something like this. <laughs> Excuse me. It has <clears throat> it become multi-platform, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary work. Come on, now <laughs> please tell us. <laughs> this is one of them. So. Um, I guess it started with the Syrians coming coming to Turkey uh, in, in with the war starting in 2011. Uh, I was really interested in what was going on to with those people, uh, um, not just the Syrians, but also the Turkish people who uh, as a host country. Uh, and um, I, I was thinking, I'm so far away, what can I do? I can't do anything. And at some point when I was, I think, listening to a talk similar like this, uh, so somebody doing humanitarian um, work 
who is an academic who was doing research on this. And then obviously I was like, of course, all I can do is research and spread the word and, you know, share the issues around those people. So on the one hand, that was happening. That happened actually five years ago. So that's 2017. Um, before that, in 2014, I started CA City, Cinema and Architecture in the City Collaborative Research Group in, in Queens. So eight years now. So this is our website, cacity.org. Um, I'm also doing uh, urban filmmaking workshops that are open to public. Uh, the very first one I did in Itu, actually, in Istanbul. Um, so you can see workshop films here um, in, in this link. These are my student films. In uh, When I teach history and theory, uh, I actually make the students make architectural films. So some of them are here. Um, some film suggestions, um, but also if somebody is interested in how I do the workshops, uh, this Belfast link here, Belfast 2015, explains the procedure if anybody wants to do their own. And these are the, um, the films. I team up people who don't know each other. Say one architect teams up with a photographer. One um, sociologist teams up with a, a sculptor. And then I make them make films um, in a week. We do this from Monday to Friday, very intense workshops. So that's outside of university. That's something else. Let's go back. So CA City basically tries to bring people who are interested in cinema, architecture and the city together. We do things together. So Walt Cities is a product of CA City. It's um, I also became interested in uh, divided cities. You know, obviously, I live in Belfast. We had the troubles in uh, 70s, 80s and um, into the 90s. Um, and this is or was a divided city. It's a post-conflict city. So uh, that be, that interest and my interest in um, the, the, the situation um, in, with the Syrians in Turkey, because, you know, the numbers each time I uh, checked, there is three million Syrians in Turkey, three and a half million. Whenever I write about this, I had to check the numbers because the numbers increased every time, every month I checked. Four, four and a half, if it went up. So I was hoping uh, to find different ways where architecture could provide um, a safe environment for the locals and uh, the newcomers. Uh, to um, to link somehow to um, for the newcomers to integrate into the society they are coming in in a peaceful way. Um, it's hard for the newcomers, but it's also hard for the locals. So how can that be achieved when we are talking about millions of people, not thousands, millions of people? So, but I believe in the power of architecture. Uh, so with my interest in Syrians and humanitarian architecture, my interest in cinema, my, me being in Belfast and being exposed to a divided community um, when I live here, wall cities emerged. I also like walls a lot. Uh, it's also in my even, you know, in this little book, I talk about the Berlin Wall because I look at Wings of Desire from um, Berlin uh, all the way in 90s. So uh, every year we choose three films. In this one, in the sec, this is 2018. This one is an East uh, German film, uh, The Legend of Paul and Paula. This one is walls, looking at uh, different walls around the world. So this one is many different places like uh, the American Mexican one, uh, Spanish Moroccan one, etc. This one, Akamas, is from Cyprus. Uh, so I invite two speakers who either know the place, either from the place, or they um, they are an expert on divided cities. And I always invite different people. So I look at the, the issue from an architectural perspective and then say one of the guests is from uh, psychology. One guest is from studies, uh, is anthropologist or geographer and they or, or fi film uh, scholar. So they look at the film differently. 
uh, the very new one we just finished together with that exhibition I was uh, flicking through the images is this one. We showed this Cyprus film smuggling Hendrix. Um, we showed um, what else did we? A Palestinian film uh, Girafada, and then we showed um, the other one from Berlin. Uh, they're all about animals. So this one is about. Let me actually, without the sound, maybe I can play. It, it's about this dog, um, Jimmy, named them after Jimi Hendrix. Um, who crosses the, the the border and the dog can't be taken back? It's it's not a law. It's a it's a comedy, really well made. And um, this actor you may remember from Fatih Akin films um, um, from from Germany. He actually uh, films a lot in in Germany. Um, so this one is uh, Lev Koshe, and then the other one Berlin uh, and the rabbits. Who uh, that lived uh, between the Berlin Wall uh, in the no man's land uh, during the wall period. And then the other one is about uh, a, a child who is friends with a giraffe in the zoo uh, at, at the shadow of the uh, West Bank Wall in um, Palestine slash Israel. Um, so I do these because I guess. Um, I want to share all the things I'm doing um, with the community. This is done in, a, in an art cinema. Uh, if you know the Bal uh, British Film Institute in, um, in Berlin, uh, sorry, in London, um, BFI, British Film Institute. So it's, it's Belfast version is this one called Queen's Film Theater. So we do these there, it's open to public. Um, lots of students are also invited, scholars are invited, and we show a film about a walled city, a divided city, and then uh, we discuss it. So for this one, I had um, a Colombian uh, architect who is an expert on divided cities, and he brought in some Colombian musicians as well. So we had some Colombian music at the end. Uh, and then we had um, a Turkish psychologist, um, Gülseli Baysu uh, from Queens. Um, I do these and um, this year we did this together with the exhibition, which was a great success. This is the Ber um, Rabbit a la Berlin. This is the Berlin film uh, with another local expert here. And then you go to the foyer uh, of the cinema and then the exhibition is the foyer. And on this TV, you can see all the films our students have made. And then this is one of the engineers to, who developed the app for the um, for our buildings. And this is their tutor, their teacher. Yeah, that one is the, the last one. So there were there were three events. You can see all of them here. The exhibition and then this discussion. This is the Palestinian one. I recommend this film. It's pretty good uh, called Girafada. OK. I think you're muted, Ishel. Excuse me, while coughing, uh, I closed the uh, yes. Um, wow, well, good. I think <laughs> there is a totally up. different aspect, actually. Also, students write dissertations with me, like master thesis yeah. uh, on cinema and architecture, and then we they publish them like not publish, but you know, print them like like books. This one is uh, not hard to guess. It's on Blade Runner. There's always someone interested in Blade Runner all the time. Uh, that's another aspect. You can use it in design, but you can use it to understand. You can look at the architecture in um, in films through through research, similar uh, the, to the way uh, you and I work with film. I guess one more thing I can I can show uh, is something we recently did with uh, Ushul. So this book is coming out uh, just uh, in a week. Uh, from Rotledge, uh, Francois Pans is the um, editor, uh, and then uh, Ushul and I have this chapter in it. It's called Everyday Practices and Lived Spaces of Refugee Children on YouTube. 
So it takes cinema it, uh, or, or film, the medium of film, it takes uh, the refugee studies uh, and then it takes uh, lift space architecture and it combines it together. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, again. <laughs> you appreciate me good. Do we have any more questions, oh. Ishel? What are we doing? Okay. <laughs> okay. I think uh, we shouldn't take up more uh, the guest time. And uh, if you don't have uh, uh, anything else uh, to add, uh, let me finish it, uh, the talk slowly and maybe we can get uh, some questions uh, too. And uh, yes, that's all for today. Thank you very much for having us. We come uh, to the end of our uh, talk. Uh, we would like to say thanks again to you and thank you for the informative uh, and interesting talk. I really appreciate you for giving us uh, insights. Uh, hopefully uh, this inspiring talk uh, will be beneficial for everybody and indeed your talk is uh, stimulating especially for those who wants uh, who want to study in fields of cinema and architecture uh, now uh, it's time for your uh, questions uh, i think uh, we uh, can take very very uh, <laughs> uh, love questions and uh, rest assured that we will uh, try to answer uh, if possible um, and if you need to ask any further questions please leave your uh, email address and we will be happy to answer the questions at a later date you uh, uh, can believe I, I did put my email address in the chat um, hopefully you see it. If anybody needs help with anything, has questions to me, um, they can contact me later as well. But if anybody has any questions right now, they're they're welcome to to ask um, right now as well. And however, I couldn't uh, see my chat box. By the way, uh, I yes, jumps hand. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, Nilay Hocam, uh, do you want to add something? Uh, uh, thank you, Ushil Hocam, and I would really like to extend my uh, sincere thanks uh, because I think this had been very uh, inspirational uh, for our students, also for us, uh, because with passing to online education, in fact, I mean, uh, cinema had been more in the agenda of, I think, uh, everyone, also us as uh, like um, instructors who are teaching architecture. For instance, we in the first year studio, uh, somehow we try to uh, benefit uh, from uh, cinema a bit. Uh, we worked on the film Haima and used it as a, as a site for the students. Right, okay. uh, and. Uh, they designed uh, states uh, for civil roles and then they included their states to the movie somehow. So they taught techniques about, you know, editing techniques, etc. And we taught about atmospheric issues. And at the end, we were really very surprised about the uh, outcomes. So uh, it really triggered their, uh, I think, creativity somehow. Uh, so uh, I mean, in line with that, I would like to ask a few questions, maybe if it's not too much. First maybe, of all, maybe you can send me some of the some of the films they have made uh, just to have a look. I'm curious what your students have made. Of course, of course, maybe. I mean, they have a portfolio. I will try to find and send you maybe the, the whole uh, process uh, because uh, it was also very exciting for us. Um, and uh, you started with the memory issue and I started thinking about the ritual of watching a movie somehow. I mean, watching the movie in a space specifically designed for it and we started uh, to lose it. And I think pandemics uh, had been another <laughs> factor in that. Uh, now, I mean, uh, we have the Netflix, Netflix supporting, I mean, supported movies. So 
It's like uh, we are carrying our cinemas uh, in our phones or in computers. So I just want to know what do you think about that? Uh, because we are also talking about the link between architecture and cinema. But I mean, this uh, architectural aspect of, you know, watching the movie in a space specifically designed for it, the ritual is kind of getting lost or it's transforming. What do you think about this? Uh, that, that, that's a very important point. I still love the black box of the, of the cinema theater. Going to cinema, the lights go down, the room is dark, collectively as a group we watch a film. I still like that. But uh, I also like the fact that uh, film watching is not limited to cinema going. I like the fact that students um, uh, use AutoCAD, you know, to draw their buildings. And on the side, in a smaller screen, they're playing Netflix to watch um, to watch a film or music video, et cetera, not just music in the background. I, I, I like that. Uh, and whenever it's appropriate, why not? Why are we limited to one, uh, one frame or one screen um, on the computer when we can have so many windows at the same time? Each window is a window, just like the real window I'm facing. I look at a lovely tree outside here. Um, each win each uh, uh, virtual window in, in the screen is opening uh, to, to the world. Uh, right now, um, I'm sitting in Belfast. You guys are sitting in Istanbul. All of you are in different rooms. Nobody's together, um, but we are in the same room through these uh, through these windows. So the meaning of architectural space is changing with the addition of these digital windows into our lives. In my opinion, it's positive. It's enriching. The fact that um, well, um, it, it, when when you uh, see young people being immersed into the digital more than the real, you sometimes worry a little bit. But they are a different generation than us. They will find just like we found our own way, you know, um, in the past with radio and then television and then computer and then the smartphone. Uh, we, as humanity, we, if we if we don't kill the planet. Uh, we will find our way uh, to deal with the technology. So I personally see it as as a positive thing. What do you, what do you think, Nila Yocha? Um I agree, especially after experiencing, you know, its effect in the first year basic design studio because we were a bit worried, kind of, you know, using this uh, kind of technique. I mean. Uh, it was really very really amazing to see how you have used uh, this uh, and it's uh, two way. I mean, uh, as you have also shown in the structure uh, of your studio from cinema to architecture and architecture to cinema. Uh, in fact, ours was like, you know, uh, not that structured, but more intuitive maybe. However, I mean, the, the end results also made us think that, uh, yes, I mean, uh, I think they are very ready to find their own way and somehow uh, maybe we should be also somehow uh, ready to, you know, uh, forget about what we know. Uh, we need to forget about preconceptions and maybe start uh, looking once again, uh, you know, anew uh, to that new field. Uh, I believe that, I mean, um, especially after seeing your uh, works, uh, I was thinking that maybe it, it was not only in our studio, but, you know, everywhere. Uh, I know that you are specifically working on that, but I was also wondering about your observations, like, you know, how the pandemics affected this, uh, you know, uh, teaching practices, the, the pedagogical, uh, maybe, um, you know, approaches and do you think that cinema will be more included, not only, of course, in graduate level, but also uh, undergraduate level? I mean, I feel that somehow it's not new, of course, but apparently in the future it will be more involved uh, to our studios. I I totally agree. Let me quickly share my screen again. Um, if you're if you don't kick me out, uh, are you guys also using Miro? Yes, your... all the time. 
Miro no, is, no. is like, I love Miro. What would we do during the pandemic if we didn't have Miro? Uh, and um, we went back to face-to-face -to -face teaching in studio, but we still use Miro. We still don't print. Um, so every, every so the, the way we do it is uh, students have their work. Uh, every sorry, every student has uh, their own, you know, part on the virtual wall. I call this the studio wall. I think this is a wall. Um, and then every week they upload their work and then we give them feedback uh, verbally and we put in links, you know, some um, uh, good architectural examples, etc. Every week uh, the work is accumulated on this mirror board. Um, and then it goes on and on. And then we do the reviews, the uh, jury also here uh, on Miro. Uh, we share the screen with our reviewers. They come in as well. Here is one uh, us putting, uh, uh, giving suggestions to the student here. We are helping them, you know, uh, drawing on uh, their, their stuff. Uh, I'm sure you do the same. Uh, and then it goes on. It's it's kind of amazing when you. But we still uh, love being in the same space. Students do too because uh, the studio culture is harder um, when everybody's at home. It's much better when things are digitized, like here, and then you. Uh, you meet in the same room, you know, just before class, after, I, I, during lunchtime, you chat a little bit with the students. They uh, they chat with each other. Um, I think this blended, you know, learning experience is um, is the new future for education. I worry more about um, you, uh, the education before university. These kids who are born into a digital, you know, learning um, environment, uh, who are now um, up to 18, um, they can use the computer perfectly. They can Google anything and get the information. But still, we teach them, you know, um, the, the Ottoman history, the way it was taught uh, 50 years ago. What are the results of these wars? You know, who were the sultans? I'm just making it up. I don't know. I don't even remember how we were learning those. But you don't need those anymore. So you need um, young people who can gather information from um, from the sources that are available and who can filter all that information because there's too much. It's not about uh, keeping things in your mind. It's about being creative about um, the information you're exposed to. So all of education system, I believe, now we are moving from cinema and architecture to education, but uh, it makes sense, uh, I guess, um, your question. Uh, I, I think we re need to rethink. I think we are doing better in universities. Um, for rethinking uh, how uh, young people learn. Uh, and I think it should move down to um, secondary school education as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to finish with uh, if you're finishing, I want to finish with a film, but if it is too late, it's just one or two minutes long. If it's too late, that's OK. No problem at all, please. Oh, OK, uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this talk, uh, especially the fact that we didn't really make it uh, a PowerPoint kind of presentation. This was much, uh, much more creative with Ushiloja's uh, questions. Um, just before the pandemic, we mentioned the pandemic. Uh, myself, I was on sabbatical. Uh, Christopher Wilson, my co-author for the Berlin book, was on sabbatical and we were in Berlin. I invited a Dublin-based filmmaker, Paddy Cahill, to do a workshop with me um, in Berlin. Uh, we had, uh, you know, people coming from all over Europe, 15 participants, and then the pandemic hit. People cancelled, but we still uh, did the did the workshop with local people, uh, uh, participants from um, Germany. Um, so a few of them were there. We couldn't even stay because this was uh, mid-March. 
uh, all of us had to go back home because we uh, we were worried that the flights would be cancelled. March was quite uh, problematic in Italy. If you remember, it came, it was horrible in Italy and it was moving towards Berlin up at the time. So we started this workshop um, uh, somewhere called ZKU, uh, Center for um, Urban Art and Urbanism. I, I recommend to people to do a residency there if they're interested. It's more, uh, more for um, um, artist residency, but I was a researcher there. Anyways, we did the workshop there and this uh, Turkish uh, participant who is a tour guide who lives in Berlin and um, gives tours to people, um, he brought in um, a book by Ahmet Mithat and then he used that book and uh, the, the, his voice you will hear is from that book. So the, the phrases are from this book. Um, and he combined that with memory architecture and then um, the new and the old together. It's really, uh, I find it quite interesting. I wanted to finish with that. Let's see if it works. Oh, I did something wrong. Um, not this one. It disappeared somewhere. Maybe it wasn't meant to be. I'll, I'll try again. It's playing but not showing. Maybe. Oh. The technology was going pretty good up until now, but. Huh. İşte bu sütunlar beş kapı teşkil eder ki, orta yerdeki beş buçuk metre genişliğinde bulunan büyük kapı, yalnız saray arabalarının geçişine tahsis edilmiş ve üçer metre ve seksener santimetre genişliğinde olan diğer dört kapı umuma açılmıştır. Bu eski müze 86 metre uzunluğunda 53 metre genişliğinde 19 metre irtifada gayet heybetli bir binadır ki cephe ciheti 18 büyük mermer sütun ile Yunan tarzı mimarisinde tezin olunmuştur. <Gülüyor> Yeni inşaat esnasında gayet muntazam dağımlar yapılıp sokakları sulamak, süpürmek ameliyesine de ehemmiyet verildiğinden şimdiki halde bu şehir havacı en güzel yerlerden sayılır. Şillerin heykeli işte bu tiyatronun karşısında dikilidir ki 1871 senesinde yapılmış yeni eserlerden ise de gerek asıl heykel ve kürsüsü Safi Akmermer'den yapılmış gayet güzel bir eserdir. Bahçenin en kalabalık yeri ve en güzel mahalli de burasıdır. Bahçenin içinde birkaç büyük heykel vardır ki, Almanya'nın en meşhur şairlerinden Goethe ile 3. Friedrich Wilhelm heykelleri bunların en güzellerindendir.
e, müzik, kitap, görüntüler, binalar hepsi başka yüzyıllardan. Yani Berlin'in farklı farklı e, bellek katmanları e, üst üste konuyor. E, hoşuma gidiyor bu film. <gülüyor> Başkaları da var sitede. Bakmak isteyen e, baksın. Çok çok teşekkür ediyorum hepinize. Biz de teşekkür ederiz. So many, many thanks for this very nice lecture and this talk. Gül hocam, Işıl hocam, uh, to both of you. It, it was very stimulating for me myself actually. I'm, I'm sure it was the same for everyone. Uh, I have my own questions, but I think I will keep them maybe for later, uh, maybe <laughs> for another session, hopefully. So thanks a lot uh, for this very nice uh, session. Gül hocam, Işıl hocam. Uh, and uh, as the Faculty of Archite Architecture and Design at Bahçeşehir University, we have a small tradition. Uh, we make a small donation in our guests' names. So today, uh, a small donation has been made in your name uh, to Say Foundation, uh, which helps to underprivileged children for their education. Fantastic. So, once more, thanks again. Uh, many yeah. thanks for your uh, effort and time. Hope to see you again. Uh, Çok teşekkür ederim. Yeah. <laughs> many thanks. Thank you again um, for attending us. Um, we appreciate for being there. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining in, for attending and have a good night and see you for the next time. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank Bye. Thank you very much. It was lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>